I've just been reading a fascinating uh, article by Tyler Cohen in the New York Times called The Upside of Waiting in Line. Now, the typical thing about waiting in line is that uh, there is a supply and demand, which, of course, you can never really defeat, but government decides to put in a price ceiling at R. That is, the price cannot exceed R because this is fair. And we want to hold these prices down, but because of the forces of supply and demand, which cannot be uh, legislated away, we get a shortage. And one of the things that happens in shortages, as Tyler points out in the very first line of his article, is long lines. And this was a characteristic of the communist Soviet Union, where we're dealing with necessities and there really wasn't enough supply, but of course the price of bread had to be low because it wouldn't have been fair otherwise, and you end up getting all these lines. So that's our setup. So let's imagine a theater. It has only a certain number of seats. Tyler Cohn talks about a theater in New York City where there are always it seems to be long lines for the popular shows and high prices and what have you. But in any given theater where there's a limited number of seats, you may have a great opportunity to use market segmenta segmentation and price discrimination. Now, if you recall from the text, price discrimination requires that you're able to segment the market, that the people who buy at a lower price can't turn around and sell that item to those at the higher, uh, who would have had to pay the higher price. So a perfect market segmentation is an afternoon ticket to the uh, theater and an evening ticket to the theater. Uh, less people want to go in the afternoon. There's too many other things going on they, they could be doing. And the evening is the time to go out and the uh, time to see all the bright lights of the city and to have a great evening on the town. So the demand is much higher in the evening. Those who pay an evening price of P.E., then are paying a premium over and above those who are uh, there in the afternoon, but notice the market completely equilibrates. No problem. Textbook answer. Tyler Cohen introduces the idea that uh, what if price P.E. is really too high? Um, now, what do I mean by too high? Obviously, this is a profit-maximizing position for the employer, and or, or not the employer, but the theater owner, and you'd want to be able to, uh, to make as much as you can here. So wouldn't that be a great thing? Well, what if price P.E. really meant that you really only had the, you know, a lot of rich folks coming in the evening and none of your young folks? Why might a theater owner actually voluntarily lower the price from what they could charge. Well, this is the fun of reading Tyler Cohen's article. I think he nails it. But let's suggest that that's exactly what this theater owner does. He decides that the price P.E. is really too high and lowers it to the red line that you see. The restricted price, the evening price there, is uh, much lower. And this means, then, of course, that there is a greater quantity demanded for the evening performance uh, than there are seats available, and that creates a shortage. And lines. Why is that a good thing? doesn't seem to be a good thing at first blush, but Cohen suggests that those who are standing on line are maybe those who now, because the price is lower, are those in slightly lower income distribution, those who have less money, those who are, let's see, who has less money, the young. So if the rich, who are often the older folks, uh, are... are only ones to come, uh, that'll be fine, you make some money, but the buzz created about your th show, the social media that uh, emerges, the, the word of mouth among the, uh, the younger folks might actually create a lot of benefit for you. And when people are standing online, they're texting and, and uh, 
tweeting and saying, hey, here I am at this theater getting ready to see this fabulous show. And uh, afterwards, they come out and they tweet and they say, okay. So there's a social media aspect to here. You create buzz. You, you actually get a, uh, a, a shift in the demand, perhaps, for future evening performances, that the demand shifts to the right. And you go, well, gee, you're still at PE. How are you making money? Well, you, you create this uh, opportunity to st- maybe stay, keep your show on at that theater longer and so forth and so on. The market has been segmented but not because of shortages in the ability to produce have prices uh, uh, created these long lines, but a willingness of the employer to sacrifice revenue. So you can only sell Q sub S number of seats. And the employer, or the theater owner here, has absolutely sacrificed the size of that red box uh, in profits just to get some social media buzz? Doesn't make sense, but uh, again, read Tyler Cohen's article. There's a lot more here than I'm able to say in a few minutes. But imagine if you are one of the rich. You would have paid PE and not thought anything about it. I don't know about you, but I absolutely hate lines. And if I were also rich, I would do almost anything to avoid a line. Uh, You've seen and heard of people slipping the mater d' a little bit extra money so they can get a better seat. But what if the theater does something like that? They actually charge a membership fee, uh, a subscription for the year, a backstage pass, a early seating, a cocktail before the event that uh, uh, requires a you know a high price ticket. Then what happens is there's a price up here for the rich, and that price for the rich is something that people would pay a premium to avoid the lines. The longer the lines, the higher that premium. Because if I'm rich and I see a little line, I don't like lines, but I'll stand in it. On the other hand, if that line is around the block and the weather's bad and all kinds of things, I'll pay a huge premium to be able to uh, avoid those lines. And that's what's being counted on here because now the blue line, blue box represents the revenue, the premium that the rich are able to receive and if the blue box is bigger than the red box they've actually made money and a final note this is a private theater private property owned by the theater owner and He can exclude or she can exclude anyone from the use of its services. No problem at all. Public goods are non-excludable. A park, uh, the ability to uh, breathe fresh air and so forth. It's public. National defense, we're all protected. Uh, If you provide national defense for one, you provide it for all. So this is clearly not a private good because of the non I mean, it is a private good because of non-excludability. You can keep people from coming into your theater by simply uh, charging them this ticket price, and if they don't pay, they don't get in. But the second part of that that I was alluding to is the idea of a public good is non-rival in consumption. And guess what a theater is? It's non-rival in consumption, at least until you hit capacity. If the theater owner puts this show on for one person, what is the marginal cost of the second person seeing the show? It's zero. What do we learn about efficiency? 
In a private market, you price according to marginal cost. This means we ought to charge first person everything and then let everybody else in free. No, it doesn't happen that way. But because of the non-rivalness and consumption, every time we put another person in a seat, we make more money. There's no cost associated with it because all the cost is associated with putting it on for the first person. If you add this in to our little chart, you learn a lot more as well. Thanks for staying with me, and I apologize about the length of the video, but I hope it helps.